All right, so now we're, yes. So welcome to um, our mid-September nature program series. As I was saying, it's seeming a little bit more appropriate for uh, an evening program now that it's dark as we're presenting. So it seems a little bit more uh, natural to be inside watching. Um, we are excited to have our very own research manager, Katie Lewis, here presenting tonight. Um, before I hand things over to Katie, I did already mention a number of our upcoming programs. Um, but I did also want to take a moment to thank our nature program sponsors. And they are Hancock Lumber, Ragged Mountain Equipment, and White Mountain Oil and Propane. So we want to recognize them for their financial support and allowing us to continue our programming, both digitally, virtually, and um, in-person field programs. I also want to thank all of you who are current Tin Mountain members. Um, your membership dollars also go towards allowing us to continue our programming and fulfill, fulfilling our mission. So thank you. Um, if you are not a member of Tin Mountain, I would encourage you to do so. Um, and on our website, tinmountain.org, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a tab that says, support us um, and there, there is membership information there. If membership is not the right choice for you at this point, um, in that upper right hand corner in under support us, there is also an option just to donate directly to our nature program series. Um, you know, normally we have at our in-person evening programs, you know, a donation jar that is certainly lacking in um, our digital format, but we do still encourage you to, you know, to support us um, in whatever way is the best fit. With that said, um, you know, I, I'm going to hand things over to Katie. Um, as I mentioned, um, we do still have a few spots available um, in the Associated Hawk Watch this Saturday, which will take place at Perry Mountain in Brownfield, um, you can register for that right on our website. There's um, an online registration link um, and that will be meeting, um, we'll be meeting at nine o'clock um, Saturday morning. Um, the other thing I will just say, um, since for a lot of us it's getting, you know, if th this might be the first time you've joined us or just getting back into the swing of virtual form, um, virtual programming and format, um, while Katie's presenting, the best way for you to ask a question um, is to type it directly into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. If it's an immediate clarifying question, I am happy to, uh, to jump in and interrupt Katie and ask it of her. Otherwise, um, I will hold on and I'll ask it of her um, at the end of the program, at which point you are also welcome to unmute yourself. Um, and, and ask questions of Katie directly as well. Um, it looks like everyone is muted. Um, I would ask that you remain muted for, um, for the duration of the program, uh, just so that we're not picking up unintentional background noise that might be distracting to other viewers. All right, and with that, all right. Okay, is my, Katie. my thing still working, the microphone? You are, I can still hear you. <laughs> Okay. Sometimes it cuts out, so just as a thing. But yeah, so thanks, Nora. I'll share my screen. There it goes. Okay, how's that look? Okay, so like Nora said, um, I'm going to be talking about Hawk watching um, in the Northeast, which is where we are. This picture actually I took just earlier this week from the top of Perry Mountain. Lori and I went to go uh, kind of scout it out. So if anything, it'll be a really great spot to hang out in the morning, really nice views up there. But so I'm gonna talk about um, raptor migration kind of in general, um, just get the baseline facts down on that. And then I'll dive more deeply into 
how we're going to identify a lot of the potential species that we could be seeing up at the top of Perry Mountain. So in general, like most species, most groups that migrate, there's kind of a spring migration and a fall migration. Um, but raptor migration, um, and by raptors, I mean, I'll get into it, but hawks and falcons, eagles. Um, but so raptor migration is a little bit different than what you would traditionally think about if you're thinking about migration. So typically there's, you know, the big songbird migration, obviously in the, in the spring. Um, but there are a couple of key differences between these, these two kind of migration strategies. So one thing that's different with uh, raptor and hawk migration is that it typically occurs over land and they actively avoid large bodies of water. Um, and on top of that, they also kind of follow these uh, mountaintop ridge lines that um, have these kind of updrafting air currents that they can take advantage of um, to conserve energy and and not really use their flight muscles as much to power to power their migration. And that's really kind of what the take home message for a lot of this becomes is that uh, raptor migration is really all about conserving energy um, and using different strategies to not expend a bunch of of uh, energy with with uh, actually powering their own flight. Um, so the best times to look for for raptors that are migrating in the fall are usually in the days surrounding a cold front. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of which is that usually with cold fronts, there are, are northerly winds associated with them. So winds coming from the north and, and helping raptors move down further south. Um, and But that can sometimes vary. I mean, some birds can fly kind of into the wind also. Um, and then also another thing with, with raptor migration that makes it kind of unique and, and kind of draws a lot of general public interest is that it happens in large part during the day, which is not really the case for a lot of other large migration events. Um, so people can actually go out and see this this happening. Um, and that also is kind of a, an energy conservation strategy. So I, I mentioned raptor migration is a lot about using air currents um, to, to conserve energy. And so during the day, we have these things called thermals that raptors use. Um, a, lo a lot of people have probably seen this happening before. Um, there are these currents of warm air, usually when the air is, is initially colder than the earth, the cold air hits the earth and then warms and rises kind of in a column and, and raptors will take advantage of that and, and ride that thermal up. That's if you see a bird soaring and circling, that's typically what they are kind of in this column of warming air and using it to, to rise up and then glide kind of from thermal to thermal. Um, and that's that kettling behavior. That's what that's called when a lot of raptors like turkey vultures or broad-winged hawks kind of congregate in a couple of thermals in, in one area. That's, that's what that is about. And so that also comes into play with why we're seeing a lot of migration over land and associated with cold fronts. It's kind of all about these, these thermals. They end up being really important. So more specifically for for our region, um, we'll be going over a, a lot of a variety of raptors. Most that that breed here and then migrate further south, um, or are here year round, but also some that we'll just see as they're migrating from areas further north as they pass through to winter further south. Um, so in general, in this area, raptor migration starts in August. Um, and goes and can continue through November, but it really peaks in mid to late September. Um, and, uh, and, and like uh, maybe a little bit into October as well. Um, and then the birds that we're seeing on these kind of standard good hawk watching spots are, are converging along mountain ridges or coastlines, really anywhere where they can catch some good winds and, and kind of coast. So this is just a, a, a graph from eBird that kind of lays out most of the species that we're going to be talking about and that we could potentially see on Saturday, um, just to get a sense of 
when they're here and then when they're leaving. So we're mostly concerned with this area right here because we're kind of at the end of September going into October. And you can see for a lot of these, um, we have several species that are kind of here year round and seen throughout the year. And this is the thickness of the bar is, is kind of how many observations uh, generally are had in this area during that time of year. Um, but so you do see also uh, along with some species that are kind of seen year round like the bald eagle, you do see a lot of these species towards the end of the fall kind of start to peter out to, and right toward the end of, of November as they migrate through. Um, another species to note here is the, the broadwing hawk that has a pretty clearly defined and set period that it's here and kind of an abrupt stop to, to when it's here. A lot of other species you'll get the occasional, you know, sighting through the winter, but this one is, they're here and then they are definitely not anymore. Um, and so this is a, just another graphic from um, a, a hawk watching site that is, is pretty local to here. Um, so this is the data for the month of September um, from the Interlakes Elementary School, which is just in Meredith, New Hampshire. And they do an annual hawk count. Um, they go out two days out of the month and uh, record all of the, the hawks that they have that, that fly over. Um, and that's also run by the Squam Lakes Natural History uh, Science Center. But uh, this data specifically then goes into this website called Hawk Count, which is a kind of a nationwide organization. People have these established hawk watching stations um, and then they, they enter their data into this website and then you can, people like me can come and pull the, the results to see kind of what's going on and in what kind of numbers. Um, so uh, this might be a little bit hard to read, but basically up here we have the different species that could be seen. And then the, down here we have the total number of species seen, in this case over two days in the middle of this month, a couple weeks ago. Um, and so this just kind of gives you a sense of the kind of things that we could be seeing. So we saw some turkey vultures, um, a few osprey, some bald eagles, um, a little bit of some sharp shin hawks. That's probably, you know, that's a pretty good number for two days. And then over here we have the broadwing hawk and we have 7,000 species, which uh, you could compare to the, the second place kind of number here, which is that sharp shin hawk with 53, um, which is just kind of an insane difference in numbers. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit when we're talking about the broadwing hawk, why that is that way. Um, but yeah, that's over just two days. I saw 7,000 broadwing hawks. Um, so as I mentioned, there's kind of, hawk watching is kind of done during, um, during the day and since because that's kind of when migration is happening um and it's a different kind of bird watching i guess than than kind of your standard songbird trips so you're uh really with my raptor migration you're gonna post up at a good spot in good conditions so a ridge line maybe that has good views to the north and the west on a pretty clear day with those northwest winds um, and, and you just kind of stick yourself there and watch as birds fly over you. Um, so identifying species relies way more heavily on characteristics that can be seen from below or also from a, a great distance, because usually they're flying way up overhead or they kind of buzz by, but you're looking at them from, from the ground up. Um, so those kinds of characteristics are a little bit different um, than what you'd normally be looking at. So you want stuff like the overall size and shape of the bird um, in general, but also things like proportions of the beak or the wings or the body. Um, and we can look at um, some, some coloration kind of field marks, um, but again, that's usually got to be, you know, from farther away. So you're not getting into minute details. You're usually looking for things more like overall, you know, a, a dark body with white wings um, or even just big patches of color on the, the wings or the tail. Um, and the other major defining characteristic for a lot of these species is the pattern of their wing beats um, and their behavior and shape in the air. A lot of the time you're kind of going for general impression of the bird overall. Um, and so just a, a note, I'll be referencing whether birds, some birds exhibit a dihedral a fair bit, 
um, which is just the angle of the wing and the wing tip. So that's that kind of V shape um, where the, the wing and the wing tips are above the, the body um, and the head. And they're, yeah, so their wings are just angled up. Um, but other species may not really do that so much. They keep their wings in a straight line when they're soaring or even potentially turned downward. So um, that can be something to narrow people down or narrow birds down. Um, so the, all, uh, another important thing to look at is the, the general pattern of the wing beats can also be diagnostic. Um, so some birds will be way more erratic. And others can be way more slow and steady or have these really powerful fluid movements. Um, and so all of that can help to differentiate between certain species. Um, so you can also narrow things down by some generalized group characteristics. So I've broken things down by the different kind of types of raptors that we might that we might be getting. So we're gonna talk about the hawks that we could see, which hawk is often used as a general term for raptors. So they're kind of used interchangeably. But specifically within the hawks, it's a specific group. Um, we're going to look at two genuses, which are the occipiters and the, the buteos. Um, and then also the northern harrier, which doesn't belong to either of those. Um, and then we'll get into some falcons and eagles and osprey. And then as well as some heavens. So this is just a, a general kind of silhouette guide, because like I said, you could be looking at a bird that's way high up above you and you can't really see anything besides the general shape of the bird. Um, and so it just appears as kind of a silhouette. So it's important to be able to identify birds from that way. So we'll, like I said, kind of get into these general grouping characteristics more a little in a little bit, but um, things like Cooper's hawk, which is representative of the occipiters, has you know the long tail and the, the rounded wings versus the falcon, which will have much more pointed and tapered wings and tail, um, broader wings and shorter tails of the buteos, and then kind of the bigger, more uh, clunky looking birds like the eagles and the, the osprey. So first we're going to talk about the occipiters. Like I said, they're a, 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 a genus of the hawk grouping. Um, and we're going to talk about three of these birds, but there are some kind of general characteristics that apply to all of these birds in this grouping. Um, so as I mentioned, exhibitors usually have short rounded wings um, coupled with longer tails. Um, and then adults, if you get close enough to see, you'll notice um, adult birds have these really kind of ruby red deep eyes, um, and, but juveniles of the species will have more, more of the, the yellow eyes. Um, and that's true for all the exhibitors that we're going to be talking about. Also with these hawks and falcons as we go on, a lot of the time males of the species are smaller than females. Um, and so for, for some things, using size as a way to differentiate between species is not always the best because there's some variability in there. Um, but it's still a useful thing to kind of narrow things down. All right, so the first exhibitor that we're going to talk about is the Cooper's hawk, which is uh, relatively common. Um, it's kind of a crow-sized hawk, so uh, I think when a lot of people think of hawks, they think of a lot bigger bird, but this is, you know, a moderately sized bird. Um, and so some defining marks for this bird um, is that it has a, a relatively large head. Um, it projects a good bit out from the edge, the leading edge there of, of the wing. Um, it also is, like I said, exhibitors have those kind of more short rounded wings, but then in comparing between exhibitors, Cooper's hawks have kind of longer, thinner wings within that grouping. Um, the other important defining characteristic for these guys is that they have a rounded off tail. Um, the general shape kind of makes like this little arc and the, they have a pretty wide uh, white band at the end of, of their tail. Um, this over here is a, is a juvenile bird. Um, and so you can see that, you know, it's got kind of just a lighter body underneath and some, some dark streaking on the, the breast. 
whereas the adults are still lighter underneath, but they develop a more kind of rufous reddish uh, barring on their, on their undersides there. Um, and in terms of flight for these guys, they have pretty steady flight, meaning they're not kind of erratic or teetering all over the place and kind of stiff wing beats. It's almost kind of strong wing beats. Um, one of the things specifically with exhibitors too is, is uh, they have a kind of specific uh, flying strategy. So off, you don't really see these birds soaring and gliding over long distances. They do this kind of flap, flap, glide thing. Um, so you, if you see a crow-sized bird flapping uh, a few times, and in this case, if it's a Cooper's hawk, it'll be kind of slower, maybe a little bit stiff looking uh, wing flaps and then, and then gliding away and then flapping again and then gliding. That's, that's what this, this bird is. So the next species is the sharp shin hawk. And it is very difficult to tell these two birds apart especially if you don't have them side by side. Um, the sharp shinned hawk is smaller than a cooper's, but that there's some overlap between, you know, the, the males and the, and the females of, of those birds. So that's not a great way to tell them apart. Um, so in a minute, I'll go over some of the more distinct ways to, to differentiate. But um, the sharp shinned hawk has a smaller head. Um, it does not extend as far out from the, the leading edge of its wings here. Um, it also kind of appears a little bit top heavy. So the Cooper's hawk had kind of a uniform body shape. This, this bird, while it's pretty small, can kind of appear a little bit barrel chested or uh, you know, kind of wider at the, at the breast there. So um, it also has a, a much more squared off tail and it's a good bit shorter. Um, the exhibitor characteristics are that they have long tails, but sharp shinned hawks within that kind of have a, a shorter tail. Um, the other thing to note are these kind of sh short, almost stubby wings. I mean, it's a small bird in general, but even proportionally, the wings are definitely not quite as, as long looking um, when compared to the Coopers. Um, this bird also has uh, a different flight pattern. So it still definitely does that flap, flap, glide that I talked about with the Cooper's hawk, but it has much quicker snapping wing beats. Um, and so it'll do that flap, flap, glide strategy, um, but it's got really frequent flaps that you, you probably wouldn't be able to count um, because it's so quick in between those, those little glides. And again, so not one that's really gonna be soaring a whole lot, rising up in the thermals, more really just kind of direct powered flight. So like I mentioned, these two birds are pretty difficult to differentiate between when you don't have them side by side. Um, but so just some things to, to reiterate or to, to talk about. Um, I mean, sharp shinned hawks are named for their really thin, pen, kind of pencil thin legs, um, but that doesn't, really help us all that much if they're just flying overhead. Um, so the main things that you're going to want to be looking at are the size of the head relative to the rest of the body and how far it extends out from the wings. Um, so some people can uh, describe a Cooper's hawk as um, in silhouette kind of as a as a cross um, as with so like the head extends a little bit further out from the wings versus kind of more of a capital C with the Shin hawk, um, just because that the head doesn't project out as far past. Um, sometimes, in well, in general, sharp shin hawks also will exhibit this kind of pushed forward, almost like hunched look to their wings, whereas Coopers keep their their leading edge here on the wing pretty straight. Um, but they, the Coopers hawks can also kind of have that little arch, so um, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and then the other thing to note is the, the difference in flying strategies. So the Coopers has a much steadier kind of slower wing beat flight when compared to the more kind of erratic flight of, of the sharp shinned hawk. All right, so the other exhibitor that we could potentially see uh, is the Northern goshawk. Um, and they're an interesting migrator because um, they kind of, uh, differentiate between, so some individuals 
are suspected to migrate every year. Um, others stay in place year round and they can be kind of an eruptive migrant, meaning if their, their food sources kind of crash, then way, you see way more of them migrating through. Um, and so for a while they were, there was a general thought that that happened about every 10 years, but now it's, it's been a while kind of since we've had a, a goshawk uh, eruption. Um, but it's just interesting that they kind of adapt their strategy based on the food that's available to them. Um, so this is a, a bigger uh, exhibitor and is sometimes mistaken for uh, a butia, which is the next group that I'm going to be talking about, because it does have kind of wide or broad wings um, compared with the with the other two. Um, something to note here are the kind of pointed wing tips. Um, and then the, the birds themselves, especially the adults, are pretty distinct when you're looking at them from below. So they have a really pale underbody, um, and uh, where, whereas the juveniles have a really, really pretty uniformly streaked underbody, um, which is also kind of unique, just the extent of the streakiness on the, the juveniles. Um, both juveniles and adults will have this pretty bold uh, white eyebrow or a lighter eyebrow in the case of the juveniles. Um, but that, you know, you, you need to be a pretty close up to, to be able to see that. Um, they also have a very broad tail that's kind of wedge shaped and uh, tipped in that white coloration. Um, so this is a bigger bird. Um, and so you definitely see that in its flight. It's got pretty stiff and powerful wing beats. Um, and it has a very, yeah, it has a very steady flight. And so you could see this bird soaring, but again, it is probably most likely going to be engaged in that flapping and gliding pattern that I talked about with the sharp shinned and the Cooper's hawk. And so that can also be a way to differentiate. If you have a bird of this size, you can't really see the coloring. Um, and it looks maybe like it's big enough to be a butio, but if it's doing this kind of flap, flap, glide thing, then it's in all likelihood a goshawk. So on to those butios that I was just talking about. So we have several species um, that we could be seeing here. Um, this is a, a red-tailed hawk, and over here is the, the broad-winged hawk. Um, so in general, butios are bigger for the most part. Um, they, they tend to have longer wings that are more rounded, so, so much broader. Um, and they also have kind of shorter, broader tails compared to the occipiters that they often kind of fan out when they're, when they're soaring. Um, and I mean, you can even see just in this picture, the length of this tail versus the length of the, the Cooper's hawk that we, that we saw. Um, like I kind of mentioned, they're a little bit slower and steadier in flight. You're definitely gonna see more soaring and gliding from them. Um, and they're often pretty kind of way high up. Um, so the first video I'm gonna talk about is the broadwing hawk. Um, and so this is one of the few raptors here that is a complete migrant, meaning that everybody goes down south in, uh, for, the, for the winter. And they actually overwinter in Central in South America. Um, and one of the, the unique things about them that I kind of alluded to with that, that table in the beginning is that they often migrate in groups of hundreds or thousands which is, you can, you can get pretty high numbers of other raptors traveling over the course of a day, but you rarely see numbers of one species like that besides the broadwing hawk. Um, and uh, they also can travel something like 200 or 300 miles per day in favorable winds when they're, they're migrating. Um, and so the kind of the reason that we get these huge numbers of one species migrating in flocks um, is because they tend to rely on each other to find those thermals that I talked about. So they have a pretty long trip to make. Um, and the way that they do that is by conserving as much energy as they possibly can. So they are pretty heavily reliant on those, those thermals. Um, and you can't see thermals, you just kind of hit it and feel yourself rising up. And so they, they tend to congregate in these groups because they, they use each other to find where the, the next thermal is. Um, I also mentioned in that eBird table that there's a pretty distinct period that they're here and then they, they don't really peter out, they're just kind of gone. Like they have a pretty sharp peak that you can see them in large numbers and then they're out of here. 
Um, and that's also because of how reliant they are on thermals. Um, and, and so they, they tend to move a little bit earlier than other raptors, um, and that's because they need to move during more predictable thermal activity. So you want to get going when the sun is still out for a relatively long period of time and it's higher in the sky and it's warming the air and, and you have these, these thermals to move in. Um, but in terms of identifying them outside of just seeing a huge number, seeing 7,000 birds as opposed to 50 birds, um, of one species. It's the smallest Budio that we have, um, and they're named for their, their broad wings. You can see how, how kind of wide and, and broad these, these wings are. Um, they also have pointed wing tips, so they're, they're, the end of their wings kind of come to this nice little taper here, um, and they keep the, the leading edge here of their wings relatively straight most of the time. Um, in general, their kind of upper side, their back, um, and their upper wings are, are pretty dark, just kind of brownish. Um, but from, from below, they have a pretty pale underwing. Um, and they also have this kind of dark outline along the edge of their wings that can be useful in trying to figure out what you're looking at from, from a distance. Um, the adults exhibit this heavy rufous, pretty dark, but still rufous barring on the, the breast there. Um, and then the other really clear signal that you have a broad wing hawk is this super wide white band on the tail. Um, and so even in this picture, we have just a bunch of broad wing hawks. You can still even see that wide white band there outlined pretty starkly against the, the black bands. Um, they tend to soar in, in smaller, tighter circles, but they're definitely actively seeking out these thermals. They'll take one up and then just try to glide over to the next one to, to um, you know, flap as, as little as possible. When they do flap their wings, they have pretty quick wing beats, though. All right, and so this is just to give an example. So this picture is not just broadwing hawks, but it is predominantly broadwing hawks. There's a couple other species in here, like some kites that we wouldn't be seeing, and also some bigger eagles and things like that. Um, this was also in Texas. But it, just to give an example of kind of what this migration can look like, um, just the sky is filled with all of these migrating raptors. So just point of interest. Um, so the next species that I'm going to talk about is the red-tailed hawk. And that's a pretty representative. When people think of hawks, I think they typically think of red-tailed hawks. They're pretty common and they're big and noticeable. Um, and we've actually had a juvenile red-tailed hawk hanging out at Tin Mountain the last couple of days, kind of terrorizing the, the chipmunks and small creatures around. So it's been really cool to see him hanging out just at the top of the gazebo or, you know, what, doing, doing whatever, fueling up for the, the winter. Um, so one thing with red-tailed hawks is that there's a ton of, they're kind of everywhere, and there's a ton of geographic variation in what they look like. They have a lot of different morphs, meaning some birds are completely, totally dark, and others are, are lighter, and others are kind of intermediate. Um, but so there are a couple of characteristics that you want to look for when you're trying to decide what this, this bird is. So obviously adults will have the red tail that they're named for, but a lot of the time you, you might not see that. Um, whether you have a juvenile bird or just a lighter morph and it's difficult to tell if what you're seeing is a red tail. Um, so one of the better kind of more straightforward characteristics for them is this dark belly band. So they have this kind of distinct area of this heavy uh, kind of chocolatey brown barring across their, well, it's almost like a belt across their, their chest there. Um, the other thing with these guys is that juveniles and adults all exhibit this kind of darker spot on the leading edge of their wings. So you can see it here too, this, this line. Um, and so not many, most other species, most other videos will just have kind of a lighter area here. So that's another thing to, to look at that can be seen from relatively far away if, you're, if your lighting is, is right. Um, so these guys will soar in, in slow, kind of lazy circles. Um, and they also exhibit that slight dihedral when soaring, which is I, what I talked about with the angle of the wingtips. I mean, they kind of have shallow um, wing beats that are kind of stiff. Um, and so, and so that's a good, good way to, 
to tell what you're looking at with that. Uh, the next species that I have is the red-shouldered hawk. So this is not as common. They're, they hang out year-round in, more in the southeastern U.S. They're pretty common down there. But, but we could potentially, I mean, they do breed up here, um, and we could potentially get some migrating through. Um, so this bird is, is a good bit smaller than the, the red-tailed hawk. Um, and so... Um, one of the main kind of defining characteristics for this guy, even from far away, are these pale, almost translucent crescents on the edge of their outer wing. Um, so that you can see in this picture that was taken way far away, but you can still see the, the light kind of coming through these pale crescents. And that becomes important when you're trying to differentiate it from other species, because that's kind of unique to them. Um, you can see it a little bit here too. It's kind of this lighter area um, that the sun shines through a little bit better. Um, so red-shouldered hawks are obviously named for their kind of reddish shoulders. They have this, this rufous kind of barring throughout their, their underbody. Um, they also have some these narrow white bars uh, through or bands down their, their tail. Um, they tend to have shorter wings but longer tails than other buteos. So like I mentioned, buteos tend to have longer wings um, and, and shorter tails. But in terms of within the group, this bird has, has the shorter wings, longer tail. Um, another important diagnostic characteristic with the red-shouldered hawk are these squared off wing tips. So if you'll remember back to the, the broad-winged hawk, it kind of came to way more of a taper, the ends of the wing there. Uh, red-shouldered hawk is definitely way more more squared off. Um, and so juvenile broadwing hawks look a good deal like red-shouldered hawks. Um, but the important things to note for that are the juvenile broadwing hawks won't have this translucent crescent, and they'll also have the pointed wingtips as opposed to the kind of squared off wingtips. Um, the other thing is red-shouldered hawks tend to soar with, with flat wings and then have their tail fanned out like the other uh, buteos. Um, and when they flap, they do these kind of quick choppy wing beats. All right, the next species that we have is the rough-legged hawk. Um, and this one is, is not super common, but still a possibility. Um, they, they kind of winter here, um, and here meaning like the Northeast. Um, so they also are another one that have a lot of different kind of light and dark morphs. So the plumage, varies a great deal depending on where you are and and what you're you know looking at um but so they they have pretty long um and and narrow wings compared with the others um and they do have that kind of those broad uh tipping the other thing is the rough legged hawk is is called that because they have feathers all the way down to their toes um which is is unique to them i think osprey also exhibit that but you would mistake those two for each other um, and these guys have, have kind of slow sloping wing beats, um, and they also exhibit a slight dihedral when they are flying or when they're soaring. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the Northern Harrier, which is not a buteo or an exhibitor. Um, it's still a hawk, though. Um, so these guys can be pretty tricky. They're also called, or they used to be called marsh hawks because they're typically seen flying low over, over wetlands um, and hovering and gliding in that area. And so then to see this bird from below is, is not super common and it can often throw people off a little bit because it's not really kind of their typical behavior that people tend to see them, them doing. Um, so some things to note with these guys, though, is this super, super long tail um, and also very long wings. And uh, they have a pretty slender kind of streamlined body as well. Uh, the main thing for, for these guys, though, for all plumages um, and all sexes and all ages, they have this really bright white rump patch that's pretty striking you know even if you just glimpse this bird you'll typically see this flash of the the white rump patch and so that's a really easy way to to tell that that's what you have um, if you're close enough they also have kind of an owl-like face um, the the way that their feathers are arranged kind of allow them to to hear their prey as well as see it um, much like owls rely a lot on hearing for for hunting and so so that's where 
you know, kind of that owly face comes from. Um, so in terms of more plumage characteristics, um, adult males, which is what this bird here is, are often referred to as gray ghosts. They're really kind of this silvery gray all over. Um, and they also have this dark, uh, these dark wing tips, these black wing tips. Um, they're uh, generally just kind of light and whitish below. And then females and juveniles um, are more brown, more streaking, and kind of like buffy below. So this is a juvenile bird and it's kind of this cinnamony color below with some streaking, um, but still that white rump patch right there, even as a, as a young bird. Um, they have flight that's kind of buoyant and unsteady. They can, they can teeter and wobble around like a turkey vulture when they're, when they're soaring. Um, and they have really smooth, deep wing beats. Um, they also tend to exhibit a pretty strong dihedral, um, but there's a lot of variability in the overall shape that they make. So you really want to look for other things like the longer tail, the rump patch, that sort of thing. Um, they also don't soar all that often, um, and they tend to fly closer to the ground than other migrants. So they often get missed at your typical hawk watching uh, locations. The other thing about them is that they will migrate during light rain and snow and do fly longer distances over bigger bodies of water. And so that again, they kind of get missed by the stereotypical ridgeline, you know, clear day hawk watching location. All right, so now we're going to move on to the falcons. Um, and so there's going to be three species here, the American kestrel, the merlin, and the peregrine falcon. Um, and this is a juvenile peregrine. I just wanted to highlight kind of the overlapping characteristics between all these birds. Um, in general, falcons have super, they're kind of pointy overall. So they have really narrow tapered wings and long, often tapered tails. Um, and they also, two out of, so besides the kestrel, they have these pretty strong rowing wing beats. They're just kind of powerful flyers. Um, so first up, course then is the, the peregrine falcon. Um, these are just generally kind of a strong, powerful bird. They're super sleek, they're streamlined, um, and they have these really, really pointy wings. So if you think of even back to the, the beautios that we were talking about, those are way more broad and kind of rounded off or even squared off. Um, for falcons, they have a pretty short tail. Um, the, an, another really good characteristic for these guys that you can see from a pretty good distance because of the stark contrast is this darker kind of helmet that they have and these two on either side of their face kind of dark mustache type stripes. Um, and you can even see that on the, the juvenile plumage as well, kind of against some of uh, the lighter uh, chest area. Um, so juveniles have still have the light breast area that the adults have, but they're definitely more heavily streaked. Um, you know, adults have this kind of almost clean uh, chest area. Um, and, and like I mentioned, they have really smooth and powerful wing beats. They, they're just fast. They're the fastest land animal with their, you know, 200 miles an hour dive bombing kind of, kind of deal. Um, and they, if they soar, they tend to do so in, in more broad circles. Um, and this is kind of many, most of you probably know, one of the kind of flagship species for, for undoing some, some damage to the population. They were really, really severely declining with DDT along with um, what most people think of with that, which is eagles, um, but they rebounded pretty well. Um, and actually like uh, maybe a little bit too well in some cases, they've kind of established themselves or been established by uh, coastlines and have have become really, really good at taking out shorebirds like plovers and, and sandpipers. Um, so it's just an interesting kind of kind of new thing to have to deal with. The peregrines are doing really well, but at what, you know, the cost of the, the plovers and that kind of thing. Uh, so the next bird that we have is pretty common. A lot of people see these guys perched up on power lines or, or posts um, hunting in open grasslandy type fields. Um, it's the American kestrel, um, and they're an interesting migrant. So not all members of their population migrate. Um, some of them, the more northern breeding birds will migrate south, and they'll actually migrate 
further south than the southern kestrels that stay in place all year round. So they kind of leapfrog over each other. Um, this is kind of a blue jay size, so pretty petite sized bird, um, but they still exhibit those long, slim falcon-like wings. Um, and they also have a very long tail that's orange in adults. Um, they have these two dark facial stripes that again, you kind of have a stark contrast that you could see from a, from a good distance. Um, and then, of course, the males have this really beautiful slaty blue wing that contrasts really nicely with the kind of rusty orange uh, back and, and tail. Um, females and juveniles have this really warm kind of chestnutty coloring overall. Um, so their flight is, is, in terms of falcons, definitely much lighter. It's kind of described as, as buoyant. Um, and they have, they, they, they have a lot of like unsteady kind of shallow wing beats um, and they tend to soar in in tight circles. They're also a bird not so much on migration but that you could see kind of hovering right in place in a field if there's not a good perch to be hunting from um, and you ever see a, a tiny bird kind of hovering in place over a field that's that's a, a kestrel which is just pretty cool to see. Um, so the other falcon that uh, could get confused with with the kestrel just based on kind of size and overall shape and stuff is is the merlin. Um, again, super super pointy wings um, and and uh, just like a small kind of falcon like bird like the kestrel. But some things to note with this this species um, is that it's kind of stockier overall compared with the kestrel. It's definitely darker in general. Um, in, in coloration and that can kind of be pulled out even from, from far away. Um, and they have a lot of heavy streaking on their undersides. Um, the, the other thing is they have a shorter wings and tail than the kestrel, just like generally a more compact bird than the kestrel. Um, and their flight is, uh, seems a lot stronger and faster than the kestrel. So I, like I said, the kestrel is kind of like a buoyant, maybe lilting flight a little bit. Um, this is a much faster and, and more powerful looking flyer. Um, and their wing beats are, are pretty strong and, and fast as well. And they exhibit pretty steady flight. Um, they mostly are, are flapping and, and gliding, but they will soar occasionally in, in pretty tight circles. Um, and so this is another bird like the um, like the northern harrier that will take long flights over large bodies of water um, and also will fly in light rain and earlier and later in the day than other raptors. So they're definitely not relying on those thermals as much as other species. Okay, so since I talked about some of the smallest birds that we could potentially see, now I'm going to talk about the much bigger birds that we could potentially see. So um, kind of from far away in general, the thing to look for with these guys is just a really big bird um, when trying to differentiate between an eagle and a falcon, let's, let's just say. So first up is the bald eagle, which I'm sure all of you uh, know and love at this point. Um, but yeah, big is kind of the main takeaway with this guy. Um, they have really, really long um, and broad, flat wings. It's often described as kind of plank-like. They hold them pretty straight and they just kind of use them to, to soar out over, over things. I think wingspan is several feet for these guys. Um, they also have a very large head and bill. So even from a distance, if you're looking at proportions, you could see this big clunky bill from a pretty big head compared to the rest of its body from way far out. Um, so for, for kind of plumage characteristics, obviously the adults are distinct. They have a white head and they have this white tail contrasting with this really dark body. Um, but then depending on their age, it takes about five years for them to reach this full adult plumage. Um, and so up until that point, there's kind of varying degrees of brown and white modeling. Um, and so you'll see after one year, white patches show up on their belly and their back. Um, and then after two, you start seeing more white on the head and the yellow bill starts to develop. So this here is a, is a second year bird. Oops, and that is, and this is likely, uh, you know, maybe a, a first year bird, something somewhere in between there. Um, but again, you know, it's just 
big and kind of slow and steady in flight, often in these kind of lazy, uh, slow circles, but they have these obviously really strong uh, uh, wing beats with a really deep upstroke. So that's something to look for them. Uh, so the other species, the other eagle that we could potentially see, they're not common around here at all, but it's always a possibility, is the gold, golden eagle. Um, and they're mostly just migrating through. Um, and they look like a giant buteo, really. So they have those kind of super broad wings and the fanned out shorter tail, um, but they're much, much bigger than, say, like a red-tailed hawk or a broad-winged hawk or anything like that. Um, to distinguish them from a distance from the bald eagles, they tend to have a much smaller head in proportion to the rest of their body, as well as a much smaller beak. So the bald eagle, you could see, definitely had like a really big kind of clunky looking beak, whereas the, the golden eagle has one that's a little bit more in proportion with the rest of the size of its head. Um, the other thing with golden eagles is if you're, if you're close enough, they have this golden nape on top of their head that uh, juveniles also have. Um, so if, you, if you're able to see that, then that's a pretty clear sign that that's what you have. Um, so juvenile golden eagles can get a little bit confusing when you're trying to differentiate between them and juvenile bald eagles. Um, but one way to do that is juvenile bald eagles will often have much more white uh, in their, their body. Typically juvenile bald, or golden eagles don't really have much white at all, maybe a couple little spots. And also a lot of the time, the, the white modeling that is exhibited on them is limited to uh, here and here on the wing and also at the, the base of their tail. Um, another species that this could be confused with is the turkey vulture, um, but, but golden eagles have much, much steadier flight. They don't really exhibit a strong dihedral. They're really smooth, shallow wing beats and they don't wobble in the air like the turkey vultures. All right, so then the other species that uh, I've included in the eagle grouping is the osprey, even though it's its own kind of thing. Um, so they are pretty distinct in terms of shape in the air. They have really long, thin wings that are typically held in this kind of M shaped, this like kind of crooked or arched, almost hunched kind of, kind of shape. Um, they also have a pretty small head that doesn't extend out too far past their, their wings. Um, and then they have this bright white underside with these darker uh, kind of wrists and, and flight feathers. Another one where if you're close enough, they have a pretty dark um, eye, eye stripe. Um, and they're another one, they're, they're a big bird, they're really strong. So they have really steady flight and with these slow kind of shallow wing beats. Um, some unique things about osprey um, is that they often migrate later in the afternoon. And then they're another one, along with the Merlin and the Northern Harrier, that will cross large bodies of water. Um, and so they're definitely not really relying on thermals that much to power their flight. They are also one of the few species that will frequently refuel during migration, which is not uh, something that you see all that often. So they're, you know, migrating over water maybe, but they're stopping pretty frequently to to fish and to, to stock up on some more energy, which not a lot of species do, which is why the other species tend to rely more on those thermals and gliding. All right, so for the last group, uh, we have the vultures. And there's only two species in here. Um, the, the birds in this, this picture are all turkey vultures. You can tell from their, their red heads. Um, but this is another you know large bird that we could see soaring. Um, and so, of course, first up is, is the turkey vulture. Um, and they have these really long, broad wings, like a lot of uh, the other birds that I've talked about. Um, but they exhibit that super strong dihedral pattern where they're, they're in that kind of V shape. Um, they have a really small featherless head um, that is red. So usually you can at least tell that it's, you know, the, I mean, comparing that beak with that of the eagles, it's definitely a lot smaller. Um, and the other thing that you can usually see from a great distance is that we have a really dark body um, and then these silvery white, you know, wide uh, flight feather patterns. Um, 
as I've mentioned, they tend to be kind of wobbly um, and teetering in flight. You see them kind of rocking back and forth as they're soaring in these thermals. Um, and so that's also a pretty clear sign that that's the, the bird that you have. And obviously they slow, like a, a soar in slow circles, like everyone has probably seen, um, you know, you just look up in the summer when you're driving down 16, you'll likely see one of these guys doing that. Um, and they, when they do flap, they have really slow wing beats, um, but they are most often seen just kind of soaring and gliding. All right, so the last bird that I'm gonna talk about is the, the black vulture. Um, and that is not as common. Um, they are really common in the Southeast, but they've been progressively moving up further and further North. So they'll probably eventually become pretty common. Um, and we could still, we could still definitely get some. Um, so they're more medium in size. They're definitely smaller than the turkey vulture. Um, and they also have a really short squared off tail. Um, and pretty squared off wings as, as well. Um, these guys to differentiate from um, a turkey vulture are kind of darker overall. They do have that silvery whitish area at the, the outer primary flight feathers here, um, but they don't have that silvery whiteness that's going down all through the primaries and the secondaries um, for the, the flight feathers. Um, they also have faster and more shallow wing beats than the turkey vulture, um, and they don't, they have exhibited a slight dihedral, but it's not as extreme as the, the turkey vulture. And then of course, they soar um, in slow circles as well. So uh, pretty stereotypical vulture behavior. Um, so those are all the species that I wanted to go over. I wanted to really quickly just bring up some of the resources. Um, so hawk watching happens all over the place. Um, and there's a ton of really, really good resources out there um, to look at things like raptor ID, but also find hawk watching stations that are kind of established and are, you know, uh, data is collected there year after year, and you can get really cool trend lines of species that have been seen over time. Um, and so the main one is the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And they compile all the data through that website called the Hawk Count that I pulled up for um, that kind of local hawk watching station in Meredith. Um, but then there's also, and so that's nationwide, obviously North America. Um, but then there's also the, the Northeast Hawk Watch, which has a ton of really good raptor ID guides that are available. Um, and then in terms of like narrowing things down, there's always Cornell's All About Birds and then the Merlin app. Um, and then also local Audubon societies are usually uh, involved in hawk watching and can give you a pretty good idea of where to go and what people are seeing um, and that kind of thing. So that is the end, what I have. And let's see, how do I stop sharing? Because uh, then I can take any questions that people have. All right. Okay. Do you want me to stop you from sharing? Stop me. <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> oh, wait, I see it. Oh, no. Okay. There you go. Sorry. I just, um, <laughs> there we go. Well, Katie, thank you so much. Um, there were two questions. Oh, one question. Um, that came through while the presentation was going on. Um, one, uh, and, and it was regarding the Merlin, it says in the picture, it looks like the Merlin has tips midway down their wings. Is this correct? Uh, I, what do, I guess, what do you mean by tip? Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, in that picture. Um, so that's more probably just some some wind got up under the, the feathers there. So that's not that's not like a a, a Diagnostic characteristics. A diagnostic. Yeah. Um, so the other, uh, um, the other question is, you know, 7,000. So when you see 7,000 birds over the course of two days, especially when are, are these, these are actual Interlake students that are counting? Yeah. I mean, I think Squam comes in. Um, is there, you know, how do you count, um, 
numbers of that magnitude? Like, is there a system for, uh, you know, counting large, you know, kettles of, of hawks as they come through? Yeah, so, um, I mean, usually you're out there over a long period of time. Um, and so you could be getting those birds in smaller groups um, and then it's way easier to count. But when you have like that picture that I threw up from uh, that was taken in Texas, when you have just a sky full of raptors, often people will kind of take chunks and estimate, you know, okay, I, I think that there are 50 birds in this whatever by whatever square. And so based on that, the area that I'm looking at um, and so that is often how people have to do it in those huge kind of river of raptors type of situation. You just kind of divide up the sky and then estimate kind of a standard unit of number of birds um, and then extrapolate that out. Katie, aren't they literally using like clickers too? Yeah, yeah. And in, in the intense ones, yeah, they'll have they'll have clickers. Just like that. <laughs> There's in the other Scott Weisenthal book, he has a crazy story about uh, raptor migration and and counting them basically. Yeah, I mean, do, do you know, do any of these organizations or watches, are any of them moving towards um, like digital supplementation? Because assumedly, you know, if you were to take images, you know, you could, you know, there might be a potential to get more accurate numbers afterwards. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think for the most part, it's still pretty much like visual. And, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd be curious if there's, you know, I mean, you would kind of need to be taking, you would need to figure out like what is a representative look at the sky and if you're gonna take a still picture or you, I guess you could be recording a mm -hmm. video. Um, but that can also get a little tricky then with figuring out what species you're seeing. Um, you'd have to have a pretty high quality camera. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I have a question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, um, but do you know the average length of time it takes for an individual bird to travel from say the Northeast to Central America? Like how, how long the trip is taking them? I don't know. I think that's, that is known though. I mean, cause the, yeah, there's been a lot of work kind of recently done on broad wing migration um, where they, they attached a transmitter to it and saw, I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a super long time. I mean, you have kind of a peak for, for broad wing specifically migration that's lasts like about two weeks. But yeah, I would say that it's not, I mean, they've got a short window that they can kind of get down there and take advantage of the thermal. So I don't think it's, like I said, they can do in favorable conditions, two or 300 miles a day, so. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, yes, we had, um, gosh, now it must have been more years ago than I think. Um, Eric Masterson present on his bicycle. He bicycled the Broadwing migratory route. Yeah. He bicycled from Hancock, New Hampshire, down to Bogota. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think quite as fast as the Broadwing. Right. right. Um, but yeah, just a very fascinating um, migration. Uh, does anyone else have, I know those are the questions that have come through um, the chat feature. Does anyone want to um, unmute themselves and ask any questions directly of Katie? I, I just have a, a comment um, about the black vultures. They've been seen up here a handful of times. They're not very common, but I believe there was one scene at the Dunkin' Donuts in Glen one year. That was a big deal, but uh, um, you won't be going there now because it's closed. So, <laughs> um, but that was that was a number of years ago. But I have I've not heard of a lot of them ever been seen around here. But they're slowly kind of like you said, making their way in. Yeah. Oh, there's one. 
Oh, yeah. So Tom just asked, do, so are the hawks roosting at night? Yeah, so a lot of times, yes. Um, I mean, like I said, there are some species that will go through the night later in the day, migration strategy. But yeah, a lot of the time they'll find, you know, like a wood patch or something and, and, and post up for, for the night before the thermals get going again. And um, do you, Katie, have a favorite hawk or raptor? Uh, well, probably the kestrel. Kestrel. <laughs> <laughs> Just so That's weird. good because we saw a lot of them. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Hope everybody likes kestrels because we'll yeah. probably see you. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Any. Um, if anyone has any other questions, um, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, as I said, you know, I know some of you are, are set to join us on Saturday. Um, if you're interested, um, if you're not signed up and interested, um, you know, please do register online or reach out. You can call us at the center. You can email me um, and we'll get you that um, we'll get you that meeting information. Oh, so we just had, so we did have one question. Any hawks that do not migrate? Yeah, good question. Oh, um, a lot of the species that I've covered are, uh, some do and some don't. So, I, I mean, obviously we have some hawks and, and raptors that stay here in the winter. Um, and then others, things like the goshawks, depending on where they are, sometimes they'll migrate, other times they'll, they'll stick it out. Um, so it kind of depends on on the species but um so kind of yes and no a little bit <laughs> so so katie what would we um expect to see what species might you know we expect to see he here year round like here in the mount washington valley yeah so we um we could have um and well and i mean so like bald eagles we definitely have year round um and then we'll see a little bit of a, well, really kind of, besides the rarer ones, kind of any, any of the hawks that I talked about, we could always see a few hanging out through, through the winter. Besides the broadwing hawks, they've gone, they're definitely <laughs> gone. Um, but, but yeah, so, so kind of a lot of the ones that I covered, we could pretty easily see through the- I'm trying to remember from the, Christmas bird count. I know right? that's what I was trying to think too. What the um, you know, and like when you see a hawk at your feeder in the winter, you know, it's like oh, which one? so like sharpshin hawks are pretty I, uh, yeah up on the the feeders over the winter. They're mm -hmm. definitely here year round. Um, so yeah. All right, wonderful. Um, I think. That is it. Um, Katie, thank you so much. Um, we'll have this up in the next day or so um, on our YouTube channel if anyone wants to, uh, to go back and see any of it. And otherwise, we hope to see, uh, see you at um, another program soon.